Well, hello and welcome to this episode of The Terry Cole Show. I am so excited to share this juicy conversation that I had with my friend, Dr. Alexandra Solomon, today talking all about love. She is a relational self-awareness expert. Um, She's been a clinical psychologist at the Family Institute of Northwestern University. She's on the faculty of the School of Education at Northwestern. She's been doing this for over 20 years. I love her take on relationships and self-awareness. And she has this beautiful course that she'll also tell us about building loving and lasting relationships. It's basically intimate relationships 101. So I hope that you enjoy this interview with Dr. Alexandra Solomon as much as I enjoyed interviewing her. I'm so excited to welcome Dr. Alexandra Solomon to the Terry Cole Show. Hi, come on in. <laughs> Hi, Terry. It's a treat to be with you. I wanted to be on your show for a long time. So this is wonderful. Well, here we are. Here we now, are. we're both obsessed with healthy love and mental health and lots of things. And I thought that we would talk a little bit about love because I get questions all the time about why is it so hard, whether it's to meet people or It's really about conflict resolution that people have. I get the most questions probably that come into me Mm -hmm. about couples getting polarized around things. And so I just thought, you know, what a a perfect um, topic for us to cover because there's so much about it. But before we get into that, I'm interested to know, you've been doing this for over two decades, and I'm interested to know your sort of origin story. What drew you personally to this work because it's specific so it's couples and family relational therapy is basically what is that correct that's right that's exactly right yeah I think that my you know I think that the the deepest version of my origin story is that I grew up in a really complicated blended family and I spent a lot of time as the oldest daughter and Mm -hmm. I was um, very good in school Mm -hmm. I created a thing called Um, preventative homework where I would get my homework done and then I would just do a little more like some things that might come up the next day. So I, I love, I love that feeling of competence that I had Mm. in the classroom. And I think that it was confusing to me then how out of control I felt at home, how powerless I was as a little person with the big people whom I loved whom I worshiped, whom I turned to that when they were, that they were struggling and I couldn't do anything about that. And so I think that the deepest answer to that question is that the work that I do now (laughs) is an attempt Mm -hmm. to care for the little girl who I still carry with me, right? Like there are times when, you know, like a podcast like this will reach all of your listeners. And that little girl in me does like somersaults because she's like, oh my gosh, look what we get to do now. Like we've learned things and we get to share things to help people maybe not feel the way that I felt when I was little and growing up. So that's like the deepest answer. But the thing I also know for sure is I love this work as I know you do as well. I am constantly learning and growing and challenged and I'm constantly brought into my own blind spots. Like what am I missing and how do I need to expand more? And so the the study of love, sex, intimacy, partnership is just such rich, fertile ground for my brain, for my heart, (laughs) for my soul. (laughs) Oh, I love it. And it's so dynamic because we know this field is changing and transforming in front of our eyes, like so much. There's a lot that's the same attachment stuff, but there's a lot that has been changing because society Mm -hmm. is changing. So now we have more same sex marriage. Now we have more um, the the, um, idea of partnership has been expanded. Now, if you had asked me, 15 years ago, what I thought about, you know, big love type love, right? The, the consensual non-monogamy. Sure. I for sure would have been like, never works. Just Mm -hmm. saying someone's Mm -hmm. getting screwed. Like someone's going to be upset. Someone's going to be hurt. And there is so much that has changed. So can you talk a little bit about the difference between consensual non-monogamy and non-consensual non-monogamy? I.e. Cheating. 
<laughs> i.e. Yeah. stepping out. <laughs> I, right. I mean, literally my field is still to this day called marriage and family therapy, right? The yeah. light, I don't, I am a clinical psychologist, but my colleagues who are licensed marriage and family therapists, like the M is for <laughs> marriage, or sometimes we yeah. call ourselves couple and family therapists, C, F, right? So even yeah. there, it's the idea is two. And it was not it was maybe seven years ago that I was teaching graduate students. I, for a decade, I taught um, the intimate relationships, like the couples therapy course at Northwestern University and their master's program in marriage and family therapy. And a hand went up and I called on him and he goes, how does this apply to consensually non-monogamous couples or triads or throuples? And I was like, um, I'm going to have to get back to you because I never, I mean, my training, right. That was, I'm sure in grad school, when it was brought up, the professor in the front of the room said, it doesn't work. It's pathological moving yeah. along. Monogamy is natural and normal moving along. Right. So we, I mean, the book, you know, the ethical slut is not a new book. They wrote that book back in the nineties. It's not right. that it's a new concept. What's new is that all of us who were trained in one particular way that elevates monogamy and pair bonding above everything else, we are all having to do our diligence to get up to speed and to understand that. And I think that we, you know, I think there are different, I learn from different people, different trainers and experts about this. But the thing that we know for sure is there are times when non-monogamy feels like an identity variable. It feels like this is my truth. And there mm -hmm. are times that non-monogamy is a solution to a problem, right? So many mm -hmm. of my college students, for example, they're studying abroad or they're in their first year after graduation and they're going to be geographically separated from their partner. They may open up the relationship. They may agree consensually to be non-monogamous as a solution to a problem. So there's different ways that people find their way into expanding that sexual boundary. But I think what's so cool about the fact that we're living in a time, I'm curious what you think about this. I think the fact that we are exploring the expansion of the sexual boundary is so cool because it means that we're talking now about sexual boundaries rather than assuming, rather than yep. people only realizing that there was a boundary there when the boundary got crossed. So it matters less to me where you put your boundary and it matters more to me, like what are the conversations that you have that help you understand how a sexual boundary is going to foster truth, um, authenticity and care in your relationship? Oh, it's so good. And it really is, even though the, like you said, uh, the ethical slut, it's, it's, this is not a new concept, mm -hmm. but the conversation that we're having around it is new because at least there's transparency instead of all of this shame and all of this, um, all of it being under the guise of infidelity, quote unquote, you know what I mean? Yep. I think maybe also the other thing that's new, and I've learned this from Dr. Wednesday Martin, is that like the sort of disclosed egalitarian non-monogamy is what's new, right? Where women as well, you know, women in addition to men have autonomy and agency. And that's, um, so I think that's also, that's an element that, that likely is different and reflects the sort of progress of feminism, the collective deconstruction of patriarchal notions and all of that. So I think that's like a new chapter that we couldn't have gotten to until, and unless we've had more expansive conversation about power and gender and sex, that it's, it's exciting also that we are, um, we're getting to have those kinds of conversations now. And the couples that I really the only couples that really I worry about around this is if people don't have shared power to create arrangements that, you know, where somebody feels like I have to agree to this in order right. not to lose you. Right. Right. So how do you see um, coupling or relationships? How much has changed in the past? Let's just even say 25 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you tell me yours too. <laughs> I will. <laughs> I mean, I think some of it's what we've named sort of expansion of sexual boundaries. I love one thing I love about the, what's changed in the last 25 years is just the understanding we have around female sexuality, right? The mm -hmm. fact that we are like, we can now more and more 
if I say clitoris, people can conjure up the image in their minds of the clitoris being actually a rather large structure, like for a long, and I think, I think we have a long ways to go still, Mm -hmm. but for a long time, most of us, including those of us who have a clitoris, really thought of it just as this little baby nubbin that's on the outside of the body. And we didn't know because science didn't know because we don't ask questions that we don't value the answers to, right? So we didn't have a full understanding of the clitoris until the last 20 ish years. And I think it's taken even longer than that to really like help us all understand that the clitoris is like a four inch sized structure. It's, um, it has lots of erectile tissue that this whole debate about like vaginal orgasm versus clitoral orgasm is a bunch of BS that the vast majority of women need lots of clitoral engagement to have orgasms. So I think all of that, like really healthy, robust sex education information is so promising because it means that we now can talk with couples about how to have a sexual sexual relationship that's not duty bound or obligation bound, but that's really founded in pleasure. And I think it means that we get to talk to young people about how to create really mutual pleasure-based sexual experiences from the get-go so that they're not Mm -hmm. doing what I know you so often do with your couples that I'm so often doing with my couples where they're 20 years into a marriage and they're just now starting to explore pleasure and play rather than just this very kind of like narrow, especially heterosexual couples, this very narrow script that they've inherited, but that sometimes isn't very like fun. Right. That's so true. And I also, what I find with people is that it's the talking about it, even the, the understanding if we're looking at a more heteronormative, let's just say, or Mm -hmm. just traditional, what it's been, is that women, they know these things, they talk about it amongst themselves. But if you were not born later, if you don't have the benefit of this, um, this language and this dialogue that's being more open and less um, shame-based and fear-based, that even though you know it, you may not be talking about it in your relationship. And I think that it's really valuable to help those conversations. And I know I love the work that you do and the books that you've written. And I know that you have an amazing course, Building Love and Lasting Relationships. So it's basically Intimate Relationships 101 that anyone can take at any point, which will give the information in the end. But so much of that course is there's a whole part of it about communicating and about how to do it and how not to do it and how not to project and how, how to create some kind of a safe container to have these um, conversations. But I find with my therapy clients that it's all about doing the internal work first with them looking at what are my, my limitations? Mm -hmm. What are my fears? What are my limiting beliefs around how sexual I'm allowed to be? Mm -hmm. Um, about fantasies, about, about all of these things that there's a, for a lot of women, especially women, I would say really in their fifties, sixties, seventies, mm-hmm. I find this because this is, you were really raised in the fifties, sixties, seventies, you know, yeah. where it was the beginning of a sexual revolution, but really there wasn't that many mothers who were having that conversation with, with their daughters. So what do you, what do you say to people who know they need to have the conversation, but don't know how to have the conversation. Mm -hmm. I think that the other, I think you are exactly right about that kind of internal work that like interior journey. I think one of the things that makes it challenging when a woman has a male partner, especially again, if we're talking about like kind of that, that bit older generation is so many, well, I think this is true for women of all ages. Like we're so taught to accommodate men, accommodate men's egos. We're so afraid of hurting men's feelings. And so there's like this collective agreement where we're afraid to give feedback and men get afraid of receiving feedback because they're, because how do you ever, how do you know how to take in feedback when the world has taught you, actually, you can't handle feedback. So what we all do is we dance around it and we accommodate and we twist ourselves so that nobody has to speak truth to you. So men don't get the practice of being like, oh my God, of course, like, tell me what, how do you, what do you need? What do you want? Like, how can I show up? Like, oh my gosh, of course I want to hear from you, hear your truth. So it's like this horrible system that we both that we've all created and then we all are 
hurt by. So Mm -hmm. I think one of the, one of the pieces has to be man, you know, man really like leaning into the ways in which the culture has not served them. Right. Like, and, and breaking down the messages that they've internalized that really limit them and create that defensiveness or that sense of, um, you know, rationalizing it or explaining it away or invalidating it because it's Mm got to be like that two way street. And that's often a dynamic that, um, that I see that makes that come. I mean, for as hard as the conversation is, for example, about, I don't know, planning a vacation, it's 87 million times harder when the, when the topic is sex. (laughs) It is. And I always say to clients, you know, be, be mindful when, when you're having the conversation, right. I, I always feel like it's helpful to not sort of shame someone in the middle of something, if you're having sex and not being not mean, but you know what I mean? Not, not being yes. like you're doing it wrong. And yet being able to open up that dialogue to do that. What I find with my therapy clients is opening up in the session, opening up with me, us mm-hmm. having a conversation where they're putting words to it or exploring their own body, being self-sexual yeah. before they know, because there's a, it's a lot to put on a relationship if you don't know yourself sexually, mm-hmm. yep. right. You know, what's not happening or, or what you're either, if you're not being orgasmic or whatever, but again, I'm always like, it all starts with you. And I know you're the same because how, how can you tell someone <laughs> you can't just tell someone what's not working. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Well, you have to go forward and say, what is working? That's right. That's right. And very often I have men in therapy who are like looking at their wives being like, seriously, I will be your sexual like (laughs) servant. Like you just tell me what you want. I, you know, like, what do you want? What do you want? What would feel good? And she oftentimes like a deer in the headlights because she doesn't know what feels good and it feels overwhelming. And there's a way in which maybe it kind of also feels like she needs to figure out what feels good so that he can feel good. So again, it's like a Mm -hmm. weird flip-flop where it's like, you so want me to feel good, but now here's another demand is me figuring out how to orgasm so that you feel better. So it's just like, we need to like burn that whole system down and have it really be that sex becomes a place where she goes to feel however it is she wants to feel right. That, that idea of kind of anchoring in of like, what do I want to feel in sex and what needs to happen outside of the bedroom that Mm. helps me, you know, that sort of um, Emily Nagoski does such a beautiful job of talking about the accelerator and the brakes that certainly having things that like remind us why sex would feel good. Those accelerators, that's helpful, but it also is about not stepping on the brakes, not having things happening in the bedroom, inside of my brain, in the space between us that really triggers my brakes and makes sex feel impossible or like a chore. And so a Mm -hmm. lot of it is like, how can the couple work together to help her feel like she's got lots of permission around sex and lots of agency around sex. And listen, sometimes the desire discrepant, like sometimes it goes the other way too, right? Where he's the one that really is struggling to tap into his desire and his arousal. And she's the one like, can we do it now? Can we do it now? So it isn't always that way, but I think oftentimes the couples I'm working with, it really is more that she just is taking off layers and layers and layers of shame and body image challenges and a sense of like, not really, not really feeling at home in her own skin. Mm -hmm. And I also think there's a lot of pressure that comes with as much as we, we want to burn down the old paradigms, right? These schemas that have been planted in our unconscious minds there can be pressure, especially if it's, if there's male performance issues, mm-hmm. there's female performance issues where if, if the orgasm becomes the Holy grail and it again, feels like it can feel, I've had clients say it feels performative. Like I need to have an orgasm. So my partner feels okay about themselves and their technique basically. Yeah. And so, I mean, I'm always like, I would don't think lying about having an orgasm is the way to go. Mm-mm. Because I mean, what are your thoughts on that, Alex? No, I agree. I agree. <laughs> I, I mean, faking orgasms, you know, the research shows that women, um, especially women who have sex with men, you know, it's very, very common. It's, it's quote unquote normal in terms of how incredibly common it is, but yeah, it's a miss, it's a miscommunication. And I think it's a, I think women do that to try to solve a problem. And the problem is the heterosexual 
script. I, you mentioned like male performance issues. And that's something I feel like I spend so much time talking about is I really want men to feel liberated from the ways in which the heterosexual script is completely centered on what his penis is doing. When <laughs> in reality, if we remember that 75% of women have orgasms from things that aren't penetrative sex, then yep. his erection really doesn't matter that much. And maybe that's a little bit like unnerving, right? To like decenter the erection from, from sex. But it's actually, I think there's another way in which it, this could be really liberating for men that what's happening to your penis does not matter that much. Your entire body is able to give and receive pleasure. And I think there's a way in which the field of sex therapy has sort of done men dirty by focusing so much on like these very behavioral techniques to help men get orgasms and keep orgasms and mm -hmm. not come too soon, but not come too late. And it's all about this, like what's happening to that one part of the body that I think ends up just feeling like a pressure to, to both partners that everyone's yeah. kind of like, Oh no, what's ha Oh no, not now. No, not yet. Okay. But how about now that just, that is, it, it just adds pressure where, um, where we'd rather have like ease. Yeah. And I, I so agree when you think about how clitoral orgasm is the way that three quarters of the way women achieve orgasm. And there's so many creative ways to use your mouth, to use your hands, to use yeah. whatever it is yeah. that creates a, a different intimacy. And there's so much ego involved when it's in that performative place. And it feels to me, it's just the opposite of loving, right? Mm. It's so, it can be so stress inducing. I would have clients come in and just suddenly sex becomes worse than just an obligation, right? It becomes, mm. feels like a minefield of like, talk about how are you, there's no relaxation when you're so worried or when it has become so performative. And back to what you had said, Alexandra, about um, managing men, right? Managing them. We don't believe that you can handle the feedback we've been taught. Now we may not right. consciously think that, but certainly there is, this has been messaging about the organization around the male ego. That's just real. And it's interesting. And I think about my own marriage and think about my own husband. So my Vic was widowed with three little kids who were like five, three, and one. And then I came in about 12 years later to have this amazing family. But I, part of what I was so, and I'm still so attracted to him is he has so much um, female energy. Mm -hmm. He has so much caretaking energy. He's, he's very attuned mm -hmm. um, emotionally. And it's interesting. And yet, you know, that then has all these other skills and things that he does. So, but I always thought about that, that the, there was something very um, scary to me about super alpha yep. men, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Well, what mm -hmm. about you and Todd? Mm -hmm. I agree completely. I agree completely that that is, um, I think that, well, yeah, for sure. I mean, that for sure lands for me with Todd. Like I think about how, how easy it is for me to give Todd feedback. And sometimes my growing edge is to just be more, th <laughs> a bit more thoughtful with the feedback, Same. right? Like refine it, tone it down, <laughs> ask if he's available for it. Right. But I think Take it's because, advice. yeah, I think it's because, um, I think it's because there isn't a lot of need to protect his ego. In fact, sometimes like, I think, I think that he, there's times where he's so kind of anchored in a sense of himself that there have been times where it's been an issue the other way, like, especially I'm thinking around parenting, right? Where we're, we've got a seven, a, a 19 year old son and a 17 year old daughter. And so when we were in a bumpy spot with one of the kids, for me, I would add this layer, like things are difficult with this child around this issue. And I would add the layer of what have we done wrong? What, what, you know, how did we cause this? What does it mean for the future? What does it say about us? So I would take a difficult issue and add a layer of shame to it. Mm -hmm. And then I would tell Todd about that process and it wouldn't be the same for him. He'd be like, huh, well, for me, it just is a difficult issue we're having with our kid. 
And then I'd be frustrated. Like, well, why isn't, why aren't you doing to yourself what I'm doing to myself? This is not fair. If I'm drowning in shame, the least you can do is drown in a little bit of shame too. (laughs) But the beauty of that, like kind of that internal psychology of his is that it means that I don't have to spend time accommodating his ego or tiptoeing around. And I'm really grateful for that. And I think that's such a beautiful thing for a man. If he doesn't, if he isn't naturally that way to kind of do his own healing work so that he can just rest in his own worth yep. for his own sake and for his partner's sake. Yep. And how long have you guys been married or together? Mm, we have been married for over 23 years. So he was the boy across the hall in the dorm freshman year. And we were friends and then we were best friends. And then we had some beers and kissed. And then I freaked out. (laughs) So it was (laughs) a little bit of back and forth, but by the end of college, we were really securely together and then married a, you know, a handful of years later. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. Vic and I have been together about the same, about 24 years. Yeah. 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 And it is, it, it's so interesting when you find your, the right match. So you, you found Todd younger. I really didn't think I wanted to get married ever. My parents, similar, I came from a complicated, every family is complicated in their mm-hmm. own way, but where I just thought, well, marriage just, this looks not good. Like this does not look cool. Like I don't, there's so much I want to do in my life. And I got these messages from my mother, which is like, get an education because she got pregnant and had to drop out of college and make your own money so that love can potentially one day be a choice, but not Mm -hmm. a need. So I was like, I definitely took that to heart. I was all about my career, all about traveling. And when it happened, when I met Vic, who lots of people, I'm Vic's third wife. He had three kids. He was widowed. He lived in New Jersey. Like there was all of these things where people yeah. were like, wait a minute, this person's your person. And I was like, oh yeah, he's 10 years older than me. I had never dated anyone older than me. And I don't say, because I used to hate it when people say, when you, when you meet the right person, you know, you know. <laughs> I don't think that that's necessarily true. I do think though, that we find, for me, I found the person who is perfectly suited for me. I don't think he would be perfectly suited for anyone else. But one of my stipulations was that I was not going to date anyone else with an unexamined mind. (laughs) So before Vic, I was like, I would rather be alone. Like literally, I would rather be alone. And I told my friends, I'm not, I'm not going to date anyone who hasn't had 20 years of therapy. And keep in mind, I was only, I was only in my (laughs) I was only in my thirties. I was only in my early thirties. They're like, good luck. Mm -hmm. And I said to Vic on the first date, so what do you think about therapy? He's like, oh, I've had a lot of therapy. I was like, (gasps) he's like, I'm a big fan. I was like, but how much? He's like a lot. I was like, but if you had to say, he's like at least two decades. (laughs) Bring it on. I was like, date number two, please. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So make out in your car, please. Um, (laughs) There was other stuff I wanted to ask you about, though. Um, Can I ask you one you... thing related to that before we Please move on? Do. Okay, because this is the question I get all the time, and I'm sure that you get it also. So I, I hear you on that unexamined mind, and I, I think what I often say is I think there's a difference between I haven't had a lot of self reflection, but because I love you and because you value it, I will journey with you, versus. I don't believe in therapy. I'm against therapy, you know, holding it in contempt. And I think that the former, like, I think sometimes it is the love of a partner that takes us into ourselves. And I hear for you, that was like a totally hot about Vic, that he already had done that work. But I think oftentimes, especially for people who date men, where there's even more stigma for introspection, I I think sometimes I wonder about if somebody is committed to a journey of growth within the relationship, then patience isn't foolishness, but I don't, what do you think? What's your, no, I super agree. And I so appreciate the distinction because it isn't that it, it it's the willingness to journey together. It's the willingness to be like, Oh, Hey, I'm willing to clean up or look at my side of the street mm-hmm. because it's, it's literally understanding that if my side of the street is messy and dirty and has a bunch of toxic crap on it, it's going to 
impede your side of the street and the part of the neighborhood that we share together, right? <laughs> so I feel like the willingness, I'm always suspect if a client is like, I'm having this problem, but my partner says they don't have a problem. Ooh, it's my right. problem. Right, right, right. You mother, I got, if I got a problem, you got a problem. Like uh-huh. you really got to look at it relationally, unless the problem is, um, let's say addiction that still becomes the other person's problem, but that's mm-hmm. where boundaries come in as to how am I going to interact with you while you figure out that problem, mm-hmm. but the willingness. So I agree with you completely. And maybe if I were younger, I would have been open <laughs> when I, when I met Beck, I would have been open to someone who was just open to therapy. Yeah. Yeah, and but being it was willing to do their own work. Yeah, but it certainly was for you. That was a huge draw is that you knew that he had traveled to his own interior and that was really important to you. And he was secure. I mean, there was, there was such an important piece for me of having been too much. I was one of those women that I was successful. I was loud. I cursed. Mm-hmm. I, I was that, that got that sense that I had to keep myself small or when I was dating around people and I could only do it for so long, obviously like, you know, you're, you can't, <laughs> am I demure? No. So <laughs> I, I could maybe look at for like two dates, but then not really. But what I found so, um, so beautiful about finding Vic and making this love connection is that I felt like I could really fully be myself. And he's such a good sharer because I have, yeah sisters I'm very close to, my mother I'm very close to, lots, I've had the same friends since Nixon was in office, like Uh (laughs) he's got to share me with lots of people. And I found in past relationships, that was a difficulty where the person, there was jealousy or the person was like, why don't you want to spend all your time with me? Yeah. Like, yeah, because I don't want to, and and Mm -hmm. I still don't want to, and and neither does he, like that wouldn't be the expectation, Mm -hmm. you know? Uh, um, I was thinking as you were saying that, that, you know, because Todd and I have been together since we were basically, ba- and we, I have a picture in my office of the two of us at his fraternity formal. I mean, we're like 18, 19 oh, in that picture. My. So we've, we've literally grown up together and it means that I have, I've become a lot in this relationship. And I love that. Like every, you know, I'm like, I think I want to write a book. And he's like, sure. I think I want to write another book. Go for it. Like, I, I love that, that he's able to kind of expand as I expand and try these. And um, when my, my podcast came out recently and, you know, it had this, you know, kind of big entry into the world, right. It kind of like shot out like a cannon and it was really cool. And he sat me down one night and he's like, I just want to tell you, and it makes me want to cry. I I haven't shared this with anybody yet, Um, but this is what you do, Terry. Uh, He said, he's like, I didn't, I did not fall in love with you because you were extraordinary. I've never needed you to be extraordinary, but I love the ways in which you are extraordinary. And it was just like the most beautiful compliment ever, right? Like just this sense of like, I love being with you as you do the things that light you up. And that's how I want everyone to get to feel in their relationships. Right. It's like, no, keep going, keep going, keep expanding. And like, let me keep cheering for you. That's so beautiful, Alex. It's like this ability to be in your front row Mm -hmm. and really see you, Mm -hmm. you know, and I I think that part of what I was seeking before I ended up with Vic is I wanted someone so that when it was their show, I could be in their front row and cheering them on and them doing, I can acknowledge the ways that they're exquisite. Yeah. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. I love that. Mm -hmm. Todd, he's so cute. (laughs) All right. One one last question. And then I want to talk a little bit about um, your course, because I'm sure people are going to be interested there was something in the course um, about the blister study. Oh yeah. So about, so anyway, w- would you just, just give us the nutshell of that? I just found it really fascinating. I think that mm-hmm. people will find it fascinating how connected yeah. our psychological wellness is and our physiological, biological wellness. That's right. That's right. There was a study a while back where they brought some research team, brought couples into a lab and gave them like a little blister on their skin. And then they tracked the wound healing and they were able to kind of sort the couples and the rate of the, the wounds healed faster in couples who reported high relationship satisfaction and good conflict management skills, their wounds 
healed faster. Wow. So it was, it's about the immune response and the cytokines and all this kind of like physiological stuff that when that, that relationships, you know, a, a happy relationship, a healthy relationship is such a boon to our physical health. There's lots of research that backs that up. Yeah. And the contrary is true that when we are in relational distress, when we feel unseen, devalued, where there's unremitting conflict, where we don't have the skills we need, it literally hurts our body bodies. We are not as well as we need to be. And so I can't think of anything more worth investing in than the quality of our relationships, especially our intimate relationships, which doesn't mean you can't be single and happy, but it means that if you are partnered, the quality of that relationship just matters tremendously. I think that we all feel that intuitively, but then sometimes you throw a little science in there to be like, no, that thing that you feel and you know, in your bones, there's actually science that backs it up. So those investments in relational wellness really, really matter. Just blew my mind. So amazing. So tell us a little bit about the course, building loving and lasting relationships, intimacy 101. Yeah. Just t- is this what inspired you to do it? What inspired you to create this course? Well, so I've been one big part of my career is that since I was in graduate school, um, I've been part of this class at Northwestern University, which is an undergraduate class called Marriage 101, which is just a blast. We teach it every spring. This spring will be our 22nd year teaching it. And the thing I've heard so much over the years is like, I wish I had that class. And why can't I have that class? And the class is only open to 100 Northwestern students each year. So there's hundreds of students on campus that, you know, can't take it even while they're on campus. And so I have been trying to export that content, right? And it's a lot of what I do every day on Instagram and in my books, but I, but I created a course and I call it marriage 101 for the grown and sexy. So it's intimate relationships 101. It is a self-guided six week e-course with lots and lots of this, like over 20 videos, over 20 handouts. Cause I love a good handout. There's so many resources <laughs> I'm in the course. Um, you know, responding to comments from people there. We, we launched the class in January, 2021. It was one of my quarantine projects and Mm -hmm. we've done um, a couple of launches, which means we've done some live um, Q and a sessions. So when you buy the course now, you also get the recordings of the live Q and a sessions, but it really is a comprehensive introduction into relational and sexual self-awareness, understanding who we are in the context of our romantic relationships. Well, I love that so much. And because you guys are listeners or viewers, if you're watching this on YouTube, Alexandra is giving us a 10% discount on the course. And you just put in Terry Cole, all one word together, and that will give you a 10% discount. If you are interested, I will put where you find the course, which you could just go to your website, right? Mm-hmm. It's Dr. Alexandra Solomon. Is that the website? Yep. And you can even go to courses.dralexandrasolomon.com, but you also can find links to the course on the website, dralexandrasolomon.com. Excellent. And well, I'll make sure that we have all this in the show notes. Mm-hmm. Alex, this was so fun. Let's do it again. I so appreciate you and your big, beautiful brain. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for spending so much time with us today. Likewise. I loved it so much. Thank you, Terry.